Hey, welcome to a special War Chant TV edition here. And you've been around War Chant for a while or Florida State. You may recognize these guys up here because they were at Florida State for a while. And they did something special back in 2003. And we're going to talk about that today because it's very similar to something that happened this past weekend with Florida State. And of course, to my top, I got to get this because it's like backwards. Chris Ricks over here, of course, you know about him, quarterback of Florida State from 2000 to 2004. And D-Rob, Dominic Robinson from 2001 to 2004. And I don't know why we have you guys on here. I think there was a little play back in 2003 we're going to talk about, and it was against a rival. What a coincidence. But uh, before we get to that, I want to ask you guys first, because a lot of the fans watching this have not seen you guys for a while. I want to know what you're up to. So, Chris, let me start with you. I know you're doing some coaching, some other good stuff. What are you up to these days? Yeah, Gene, great to be on with you guys. Glad to see War Chan is still alive and well and thriving. I uh, can't believe it's been almost 20 years. Uh, but uh, over the past uh, 11 years, been uh, full-time on staff with FCA, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes here in Los Angeles County as a director, Coach Bowden, uh, just like Dominic and a lot of us uh, introduced us to FCA at Florida State, made a big impact on my life. Uh, so have been a blessed and privilege to be on staff here in Los Angeles County, and then also uh, running Champion Training Academy, working primarily with quarterbacks over the past uh, 16 years since wrapping up with the Chargers, and then uh, fortunate to still do broadcasting out here for uh, Fox Sports, now Bally Sports, um, doing uh, high school and some college games. And looking forward to number one team in the country this Friday, modern day, as they take on Corona Centennial. So it's semifinals out here in California. So very um, privileged to be uh, around ministry, sports, and relationships, and still around the game that I love. Well, good stuff, Chris. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it up to you, Dominic. And, uh, you know, both of you guys coming from the West Coast. Uh, it's interesting, too, and I didn't think about that, too. You guys are both West Coasters here when you came in. The nice <laughs> thing is I got I get to know both of you guys, not only in college, but beforehand. I used to talk to you guys during the recruiting cycle. And, Dominic, I don't know if you remember this one. I remember calling you because I'd always have to call late because you guys are on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. I called you like 11 or 12 our time, and I knew Coach Bowden was supposed to visit. And you start talking to me, and, and you're, I'm like, well, how was the visit with Coach Bowden? I go, well, we're still in the middle of it. He's sitting right here. I'm like, man, get me off the phone. You can't have me on when coach is in the room. But yeah, uh, you, you, guys, you guys were great to me during then. You were always great at Florida State, so I appreciate I that. But anyway. A, I thought you were going to tell another story that I remember that I'm embarrassed about now being an adult. But I, <laughs> when I uh, – after I committed and I was coming to Tallahassee, it was right around June, which my birthday's in June. I remember I had my, my birthday party to go party or, um, you know, going to – you know, I was leaving to go to – uh, to, to Tallahassee party. And then the next day I called all the outlets essentially. And I thought I called you. I thought I remembered calling you and saying like, Hey, I'm on my way. Like, <laughs> you know, the guy that's going to turn the, every, you know, uh, the, you know, be a four year all American and like, here, here comes your star, like, you know, type of thing. And uh, I thought you were going to bring that up. Cause I just remember how cocky I was when I, when I called you guys, like, Hey, you guys want to go ahead and do a story on me? Like, hey, I'm coming to town. Like, it's time for you to <laughs> start, you know, rolling out the red carpet for me. Um, here come, here comes the kid. You didn't uh, like, you didn't like. It must have been a California like thing because I felt the same way. So, yeah. Dominic, you're not alone. Yeah. It must have been a yeah. California thing. Yeah, I thought you were going to tell that story. <laughs> no, no, no. I was going to let you off the hook there, but yeah, tell us what you're up to these days, D. Rob. So I live in Phoenix. Um, I moved here maybe four years ago. About I bounced around a lot. I was coaching college football. Bounced around, kind of, you know, coached everywhere, did that. And I wanted to get out of that. I really, it was a means to an end for me. I never got into it to be a long time, you know, college coach or anything like that. I just did it while I could, while my kids were young, um, knowing that I wanted to get out. And, you know, honestly, you know, what I'm doing and when and who I am, like I'm a coach. I was a born coach. I started training guys when I was 16. Uh, I've been training guys really ever since. Um, and so, you know, that's what I do now. I run my own sports performance business. I have a baseball program that I run. Um, I train athletes. I'm now coaching high school football. I, I, I'm, I'm a coach. Like I literally, I walk, I walk around just looking for things to coach. And then I coach a life coach. I spiritual coach. I emotional coach. I meditate coach. I yoga coach. I just, uh, I'm a coach, man. Um, that's what I do. That's what I was born to do. And, um, you know, a, a big part of that is, is you know, um, attributed to, to Bobby Bowden. Um, yeah, he is the coach. 
Yep. He, yeah, he's absolutely. Stuck with, like there's no one better. There's not a human being on earth uh, that exhibited that word. Like whenever I write the word coach, I actually capitalize it. Mm-hmm. To me, mm-hmm. coach is such a special, special thing. And, and he's the one that sort of gave me the, the meaning and understanding of the value of coach. He's a lifesaver. He's a life changer. He did that for me and thousands of other people. Yep. And um, so I'm so thankful because every day I get to, um, you know, sort of pay homage to him every day, you know, even with the way that I, I manage my sons or I teach my sons or I coach my sons. I always feel like uh, I'm, I'm paying respects to, to Coach Bowden. So That's it's right. uh, it's kind of a, a really cool thing. I'm really, really thankful. Well, yeah, we're all blessed that I was able to cover him as a member of the meeting. He was so gracious to us all the time. And then you guys to be coached by him. That was the biggest thing I took away from the memorial and talking to so many people. It's amazing how many lives he impacted in a positive, yeah. positive yeah. manner. It's unbelievable. So, so I'm, I'm so glad you guys are doing stuff you're good at and stuff you love. I mean, that's something I get to do. And it's just amazing when people get to do something that they just love and it's their passion. So that's fantastic. Well, how many years for Warchan now, Gene? What year uh, you guys started like, I think like 95, 96. So wow. We're getting up there. Uh, it's changed a lot since then. But 95, uh, there wasn't even internet in 95. Oh, yeah, there was. I, I was doing the dial-up, D-Rob. I had the little... <laughs> oh, the no. And go back to, go back on Wayback Machine. If you ever see that on the internet, you can go back and see the old versions. It goes back to like 97, 98. You can see yeah. Warchant back then. It's wow. So you had some Warchant in the, that those early days. I remember the newspaper, right? Did yeah. you still even print the newspaper? No, we had like a Not newsletter. Yellow. Yeah, we, we got with the Osceola for a while. That was there, too. Yeah, that was okay. it's crazy. Yeah, we, we could reminisce and get nostalgic here forever. <laughs> yeah, Guys, I do want to get into the play. And we're going to, like I said, there was a 4th and 14 this past Saturday. All the fans know about it. I think most of them know about the 4th and 14. But I think it's interesting to have you guys on to bring that up. And we're going to show you the video. The nice things we, we licensed to have some rights to show some videos. Sorry, a lot of times you can't do that on YouTube. We're able to do that. And this is the play. Okay, let me set the scene here a little bit, guys. So it's fourth and 14 against four. This is late. This is pretty late in the fourth quarter. You guys are all the way down on your 24-yard line. This is a little different than the one that happened this Saturday, this past Saturday when they were deep in Miami's territory. You were deep in your own territory. It says a minute 23 left, fourth and 14. The funny thing, if you ever get a chance to hear the radio, uh, Mick Hubert's calling <laughs> this. He gave you absolutely no chance, was taking shots at uh, – Jeff Bowden yeah. uh, during this play. So let me go to you, Chris, first. So look at this. And you got, we had a good discussion beforehand. Set the stage. What's going on here? What's the play call? You guys first pointed out that you had, you're in the personnel grouping you have here is a little unusual nowadays. You, in 2003, this wasn't that uncommon, but on a fourth and 14, you would never <laughs> see this formation. But go ahead, Chris, yeah. walk us through what's going on here. Yeah, no, I, you know, I remember because um, right before this, um, I fumbled one of the snaps. I was looking at the safety rotation, had my eyes downfield. You assume you're going to catch a snap because you've done it a hundred times. Snap was a little off and I dropped and had to get on it. Um, Thankfully it wasn't turned over, but we lost a few yards. And so we were in a hole and uh, that's what made it fourth and 14. It was a four yard loss and and where it should have been fourth and 10. And uh, yeah, we got three wide receiver sets. I think it was our Panther set, but you have two, two running backs in the backfield on fourth and 14, which is a surprise. You think you'd be in an empty set, maybe one running back um, to open things up in the middle. But um, yeah, I just remember that we, we knew we had to get it done. I mean, this was it. It was do or die. Uh, we've got deep routes and uh, Dominic uh, had stepped in so huge at that Z position for Crafonzo, who had got hurt in that mm-hmm. NC state conference championship game when we beat rivers in NC state and D Rob just had a day. I mean, he had a handful of catches, had a huge touchdown on a post earlier. He was just hot. He wasn't dropping anything. And I knew I could trust him on that deep dig route to the left side. Yeah. D Rob, this was your game. I remember, yeah, that first half, you had that touchdown in the end zone from Chris and it, it talked about this play a little bit. You're, if you're looking at the screen, you're the, you're on the top there yeah. on the strong side. Again, what, what are your recollections and set this play up for us? Um, so I will say the very first thing again, when I looked at this was the fact that we're in 20 personnel just blows my mind. Um, what is 20 personnel? Dominic, yeah, explain you it, explain it for in. the people that don't know that. We, yeah. there, that. we have two backs in the game and not only do we have two backs in the game, we had Lorenzo Booker on this team and he's not on the field. <laughs> um, and then we, and we've got our full back in the game. Um, and it's fourth and 14. So there's two yeah. backs, there's two running backs in the game, and there's three wideouts. 
we had plenty of wideouts that could have been on the field right here. I mean, we had Willie Reed was uh, on the bench at this time. Then that means Lorenzo Booker was on the bench. That also means um, Chris Davis. Uh, Chris Davis was wasn't wow. out there. You know, th- these are guys that that t- in today's game, there's zero chance that they're sitting watching this play or standing mm-hmm. there watching this play, and that we have a fullback in the game. Um, the second thing I'll tell you, when the play was called, all of us, this was not a, um, a common call for us. And I thought it was Sting. Um, it, was Pan- it would be Panther left Sting. But I got the playbook right here, and it, it's actually – Let's go, D-Rob. Yeah, it's break that out for us. Zebra. Okay, oh, so Zebra. Panther left, pass 44. Oh, zebra. that's awesome. We actually have the play. Look at that. <laughs> There it is. I found it, and that's the play, obviously, that we're in split backs instead of uh, under center. Or or we're in – yeah, in in the game we were under center, or we were in split backs. But um, so that was – that's the first thing. And and when the play was called, I think all of us sort of looked at each other, at least the wideouts, and we thought, damn, game's over. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We This wasn't a common call for us. Technically, I'm not supposed to be as deep as I was on this route. Um, you had to get to the sticks. Had to get to the sticks on this one. It was well, you better better long had... than short, right? What's that? Better long, better to run the route a little long than short. Like Chris said, you better get past Correct. those sticks. Correct. And I and I don't think that we thought. I thought we would have pressure on it. So I didn't think. I thought you know if I go if I get to to the depth that I need to to get the first down, Chris is going to be flushed. And it was going to be scramble drill. I mean, that I think that's – if you think – if you were to ask every wide out, um, we all were sort of – none of us were excited to run this play, to be, <laughs> to be totally honest with you. We did not think, heck yes, this is a great call. We're about to get a first down. Wow. Um, I mean, as you see, you know, PK's running shallow. Zero chance he's getting a first down. Um, Chauncey Stovall is supposed to have a post. He ends up in the picture. Um You know, so his post wasn't even deep enough. And, uh, you know, I was really the only option when you look at it the way that we ran it. So it's just not a good play. Right. I mean, you have one guy out of five options that are that's getting the actually getting the first down. And um, man, that's so fortunate. The ball found me. I knew that I would get open. I just thought that the pressure I thought scramble drill would happen. And then if he's scrambling to the opposite side of me. Um, you know, the one guy that's getting to a zone that's actually open is uh, is going to be, you know, uh, covered. So I, I do remember that vividly, that we were not bouncing out of the huddle with fervor for the next <laughs> for, for this next play. Right. Um, I can even remember looking at the sideline when I lined up. You can see I'm on our sideline and I remember seeing faces of dejection on that. Side. <laughs> oh, wow. Like the other wideouts were over there like. Man, we just we had them because they had all the momentum too. Re- yeah. Remind you, like Chris said, he had just dropped a snap, and I don't remember what the the second down play was, but it wasn't like we were moving and there was uh, there was some sort of something to be excited about. Man, we were we were in a bad way. We're only on the twenty three yard line, twenty four yard line, so this we weren't feeling real good about uh, our chances right here. Now, Aslan's behind the scenes running this for us, and we appreciate that. Aslan, if you can yeah. run it forward, I don't know, about uh, five clicks there, about five seconds in, and pause it for us. Yeah, slow. So you can go a little further than that. So it looks like if you go um, on this, and it looks like there's so the Russian three. You know, we talked beforehand. It looks like they've got a spy on you, Chris. They're afraid you're going to run for 20 yards on them, huh? Uh, <laughs> I, found, I found that interesting. And there you mentioned that you got Chauncey on the bottom. And that's uh, PK going underneath, and you're you're taking off. You're like, I see the chains. I'm gonna go past these chains to make sure we pick this up. So, Chris, again, at this point, you see they're only rushing three, not blitzing anybody. You got some time to let this play unfold. What, what's going through your mind right now? Yeah, well, pre-snap, it looks like it was a four-man rush, a 40 front, yeah. and that they're gonna bring four. They bring three, and that that middle guy is just hanging out, as you mentioned, as a spy. Um, in case I'm gonna run it, I did have a few runs in this game. But, um, you know, the, the thing that surprised me is that they didn't bring more pressure because, you know, when you bring more pressure, you blitz, the quarterback's got to get rid of it quick. He's got to dump it out to a back, got to hit a hot, a side adjust. And if I'm a D coordinator, that's what I'm doing. I want a, the quarterback to get rid of the ball 
uh, quickly and not have the time to go through the drop. And the line did a great job on this one, um, giving me time in the pocket. And I was just waiting for that deep dig route from Dominic to develop. Uh, you can see PK in the slot here on the hash. He's already coming shallow, you know, really right off the ball. As Dominic mentioned, he's not going to get to the sticks. So I was just waiting for that left area to, to clear up and for Dominic to break. And as Dominic mentioned, he was deeper than we would normally run this. This dig route's normally 10 to 12 yards. He's at least 15, if not more, on this one. And I think that's part of the reason why the ball's behind. I mean, some people think it was a perfect strike. It wasn't. This pass was behind Dominic, and he, he makes a great effort and adjustment to go back and snag it. I mean, this is one of the plays where you really see the hands uh, that he had uh, as a receiver because this ball was slightly behind. So it was um, it was timing. It was a line doing a great job, uh, giving me that pocket, me waiting for it to develop. PK pulled the guy, and that zone just opened up. And uh, there was just that window there. And even though it was a little behind, Dominic just made a great adjustment to keep the, the drive alive and, and move the chains. Let's, r- let's run it to the throw, if we can. And about the point, as, about the point that Dominic's catching the ball that I want to yeah, ask. Make a, as yeah, a right make there. Point too. Yeah, I there think we go. we'll see this from the other clip, though. Um, so the other – kind of thing that we that comes into play here is Kiwan Ratliff is the corner on me. Mm-hmm. So okay. and who, who was an all American. Yeah. Right. And, right. and made, had already made a big play. I think he picked up the, the fumble earlier yep. return yep. for a touchdown. I mean, this guy was an absolute ball hawk. And um, so I do, again, when I talk about the faces of dejection from the sideline, Part of that is, OK, we're going to run a route to into their strength, <laughs> you know, with one guy and nobody else in that zone, you know, as a as an option. And um, I do remember feeling like, hey, I can get open, but I won't be able to get open in the space where I need to be in time, you mm-hmm. know. And so, the, again, them not bringing pressure saves us because when he reroutes me right here. I'm supposed to break about two steps off of this. So I should be breaking right there. And if I go flat, you know, I think that might be Gus Scott. Um, there, the safety that's in the middle. Uh, you know, he tackles me and I'm a yard short. And that's yeah, about sure. how we ran that, you know, for, for every year that I was at Florida State. You know, mm-hmm. so we ran that 100 times, but we never ran it to get this depth. Right. Yeah. So again, no, I knew I could get to an area where I could possibly get open, but the chances of Chris and I hooking up, you know, um, you know, him being able to to have the time to throw the type of ball that we needed to get a first down, I didn't feel good about it, you know. And, and again, and the 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 combination of Kiwan Ratliff and Gus Scott being in the secondary, you just didn't feel r- real strong uh, about our chances you know, yeah. running this route. Well, a couple things, Gene. I mean, if, if they blitz there, I'm either throwing it out to the left to Leon yeah. in the flat or to PK on the shallow cross. Chances are they're probably tackling one of them between 14 yards. And normally oh, on this that's play. That's actually Greg. I just realized. Oh, that's it. Greg. Great. 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 Yeah, but Greg Leon. Jones. Oh, that's right. Leon was on the field on the on the touchdown to PK. Yeah. So who's so so it's Greg, up, Greg up top? Is it Greg? And who's, who's the other? And James. Not Greg and James Col- they had a, yeah, Greg Jones and Coleman back and there? James Coleman, yeah. What? Yeah. In the- yeah, exactly. It'd be one thing they're not in the block. It looks like they're running routes. You, you think maybe yep. it'd be Leon and Lorenzo? In the game 2021, on- man, you're 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 having you're getting your head uh, you're having your head on a stake, man. You, wow, you, yeah. you roll a fullback and your 250 pound <laughs> running back out there on fourth and 14, you're looking for a new oh, job. No. Oh my God. But on this play, it's usually a three step drop, maybe a five. Mm-hmm. I believe I take a seven step drop on this, um, knowing that Dominic's got to get deeper yeah. because it's fourth and 14. It's not our normal 10 to 12 yard dig route so not a three-step not a five-step this is yeah seven. you're right this is, wow this is a deep drop boom and uh and dominic gets to the depth he needs to get yeah, it looks to like and- dominic you slowed you saw it coming in you took you slowed down just a bit there you yeah, go yeah you see my adjusted. angle you know that's that a post angle you know we essentially ran like a glance post yeah and that's not the play you know i'm supposed to be <laughs> flat it's a dig and i'm really supposed to actually come in front of that safety um that's there in the middle you know, based on the actual, like I just showed you guys, the play sheet, you know, that that route is a flat, you know, that number nine that's coming, I should be working in front of him. Mm-hmm. Right. And I just kind of, you know, I just kind of uh, sunk into that that zone knowing that, 
man, if, if we have any chance, it's going to be in here. It's not going to be in there. Type of thing. I still love how James is into the, into the boundary. Like, give me the and ball. He's looking, he wants the ball, <laughs> man. Get that guy the ball, man. He's, a ball man. he's got zero catches in his career, but he, he get that man the ball. Look at him. Oh, there he, he is. You're ball. right. He wants it. Yeah. He wanted it early, too. Like, fresh yeah. out the oh, gate. Man. I'm open, man. Feed me. James is a media mogul now. He should be on here with us. That's awesome. <laughs> I never. It's funny. I love talking about this with you guys because some nuances I've never noticed on this play. That's fantastic. So when you guys go ahead and complete the play, you talked about how you guys were kind of dejected at this point. When you got a team in a game like this that's gone so back and forth and so competitive, you got a team stopped. I got to think emotionally when you pick up this fourth and 14, you guys had to feel, okay, we got this now. And I, we'll, we'll, we'll hold up to talk about what happens on the next play because we know how big that was. But, yeah. I mean, did you guys kind of feel that energy at that point? I think so. I mean, I wasn't panicking here. I mean, we knew we had to get it done on this 4th and 14. Um, we, I think we all were kind of on, like, right here. I mean, you can see there's there's yeah. no panic from, from Dominic. The line does a great job on this play. I mean, that's looking back at those years, that's where we played some of our best football offensively when we were on the attack, when we were up tempo and going, where we weren't taking a lot of time to huddle and regather. And a lot a lot of these happened in these Florida games where it's like, hey, we got nothing to lose. We're just going to attack and go up tempo and fast pace. So uh, we were in a good rhythm in this game, and uh, we knew we had to get it done on, on this play. After we converted it, we're like, hey, we got new life, and then uh, – you know, obviously the play call was to try to take another shot because we had some opportunities um, and uh, I had PK earlier and it overshot him. So we were getting behind him in coverage. It was just a matter of execution. Aslan, yeah. if we can run that in real time one more time, if you guys got more to say, I want to run it real time once and just run the, if you got the audio, if not, that's fine. I think they got, yeah, they got the ISO on you. And he doesn't only make the catch, he takes the hit too. A yeah. lot of times that ball comes out on that big hit from someone, and uh, Dominic Nolly made the great catch, was able to hold, hold on to it. Dominic, oh, you just thinking, what, what's that thing you got that in your hands? You're probably just thinking, man, just whatever you do, do not drop this pass. <laughs> I would agree with Chris, though, about that, uh, you know, in, in terms of, like, our panic and the way that we were. It did, it, you know, because this game had so many swings, it, you know, it really was uh, – you know, it wasn't, there was, we were really calm in the moment. And, and then especially after this catch, because of the big swings that just continually um, happened throughout this game, I, I, the second that that ball touched my hands, I knew we were going to win the game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, it would have been cool to see the, the graph that they have now, you know, the win. Um, oh, the percentage. Yeah. What your percentage, percentage are winning yeah. the game. Like yeah. Before that play, we had like 5% chance to win. Once we caught that, once I caught that ball, it swung all the way to 95%. Like mm -hmm. we were going to win that game. We had the ball at the 50 and, um, you know, you felt it, but it was chaos around us though. That stadium was rocking yeah. on that fourth down. Um, and, and the, the, on the fumble that Chris is talking about, boy, it was, uh, we couldn't communicate at all. It was, it was rocking. I, I talk about it a lot about, mm -hmm. you know, people ask me all the time, what was your favorite stadiums to play in? And I'll say, man, to 03 in the swamp was, it was really, really cool. Um, the way that that place, I mean, they were loud and the ground was shaking and it, it was, it was legit. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Um, but, but I just do remember in the huddle that we were pretty, pretty calm and and collected we didn't feel there wasn't a sense of panic um you know for us you know but it did I I, I will say we didn't didn't feel good about once we got the fourth down it's like well he's just running another play you know yeah because our offense was rolling that game I mean oh, I yeah, how many we total rolling. yards we had yeah, but you we see Dominic rolling. had over 100 yards receiving yeah you had four himself. touchdowns Chris I mean our yeah. offense was rolling that day minus yeah, that, we that one rolling. turnover I, I had we were unstoppable I, yeah, I think Matt Hanshaw might have had a touchdown in that game, like at tight end, who that may have been his first catch of his career. Like we we, we really were doing whatever we wanted. Um, you know, um, so it did feel like, hey, if we can convert this for fourth down, we'll be we'll be fine. Um, yeah. 
It's just a matter of, you know, when you get to a fourth and 14, you don't ever expect to, to get those, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of crazy too. I think Donovan McNabb and Freddie Mitchell completed a fourth and 17 in the playoffs. I think that same year wow. against the Packers. And it was, I just remember the announcers being like, no chance, you know, they're not completing this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know. We, we've seen fourth and 14 before. It's just three more yards, you know? Um, so kind of, kind of crazy um, that those two things happen uh, wow. so close to each other. And, and, then, and, I, and I love the play calling this game because it was aggressive. I mean, yeah. when we got to a lot of these Florida games, we were playing with house money. We had already won the conference championship. So, you, you know, there's a difference in play calling when you're playing not to lose versus when you're playing to win. And this game, we were playing to win. It's a rivalry game. We're going for 10 wins. We've already got the conference championship locked up. Now we're going, we're shooting for the BCS. And uh, Coach, you know, Coach Jeff Bowden, Coach Dickey, Bobby Bowden, it was just a very aggressive game plan. We're going to attack them and impose our will. And when we did that, we had very good games offensively because we were playing to, playing to win and being the aggressor, not really playing conservative, but attacking. And um, uh, that's, I think, a big reason why our offense was successful in this game. And usually whenever we play the Gators, because it's at the end of the season, rivalry game, and we weren't holding anything back. And that's hey, a great Gene. segue, Chris, because I want to talk about the next play just real quick. Because you guys, you said you had kind of an emotional lift on there. You talk about being aggressive. The very next play, you go for the knockout punch because you knew you had the momentum. And, I mean, I do love the call at that point. It's like we could just kind of middle our way down the field. No, you know what? We got them on the ropes. We converted that. They're probably a little upset they didn't do it. Let's go for the knockout punch. Just your feelings on getting that. We don't have that play to show. But just your feelings on going in that getting that play call. We're gonna we're gonna launch it to PK. I'm gonna roll out, and do that, and put them out of their misery. Yeah, and it's we're in our hurry up offense. There was a little over a minute left, so there wasn't a ton of time. And uh, again, we had gotten behind them in coverage before uh, throughout the game. A couple balls were dropped. I overshot PK, I believe, on the previous drive when he had gotten by Gus Scott. So uh, so Coach Bowden and the offensive staff knew that our receivers could get behind coverage, um, especially when they went man. It was just a matter of execution. So I, I like the aggression on not having to try to risk it, getting another third or fourth down, having to move the change, but going right after it. And, and PK got behind Gus Scott. Well, hey, next Jim. time, maybe, go ahead, D. Rob. Yeah, I, I wish we had video of that play. So, I, so the call was it was take off. Why go? Okay. So, and I also played why. So PK and I flipped back and forth at Y. Yep. With Crow D out, could play every position. He could play Z, X, Y, utility receiver. And and with Crow out, um, I typically stuck to to Z because Chris Davis was young, and you know mm -hmm. I think he may have had a fumble or a drop in that game or something like that. Um, but I typically, you know, we, he and I would switch, and then that's why Chauncey Stovall was in the game at X on that fourth yeah. down play because when I go to Z, PK goes to Y, and Chauncey goes to X, or Willie Reed would go to X. Yeah. Well, um, so on that, so their coverage, they would play cover two, but they would play a trap corner way inside of the outside receiver. So I actually had a, a catcher two on the go in between the hole between the safety and the corner earlier in the game. Mm -hmm. So when they call Y go, I kn I'm knowing I'm about to score the touchdown in the swamp to beat the Gators because <laughs> they were not, they weren't guarding yeah. the outside guy go on, on the, uh, in the trap, the corner would come inside. And then Gus Scott was playing sort of a low man technique on the Y. And that's why we would call Y go. So it looked like he's running shallow to freeze that underneath the fender. And then he would go up the seam. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you look at the throw, if we were to see the video, the safety who's supposed to be guarding me is right there as PK catches the ball. Mm. And this is what made Chris Rick so great because he what he feared nothing. Right? He never <laughs> feared what you could do. He always believed in his ability to, um, you know, uh, to throw the punch. And he always wanted to throw the knockout blow always like sometimes good sometimes not good <laughs> and it didn't matter if we were up 42 to nothing or you know uh you know if it was a, a, a 14 14 game he was looking to beat you by 30 on the with the next throw like and so um but i knew that 
man, I'm going to be open on this, and I and I wish you we, we could show the video because I'm standing on the sideline. Next time, we'll bring PK on next time, D Rob. We'll, we'll do that again, yeah. with Chris. We yeah. need, we need to have a whole separate video just for that play, probably. Yeah, it's it, that would be a great video because there was a, you know not obviously PK made a great play, Chris made a great throw, and it's not that it wasn't there, but if we were trying to sort of move the ball mm-hmm. slowly down the field, like I I was. There was nobody near me, and I possibly could have taken off down the sideline and and uh-huh. scored on it. But it was um, it was I just remember when that call was made. It was totally different than the fourth and fourteen call. When the fourth and fourteen call was made, it was like, oh, here we go. Like it was just another call. Uh-huh. When he called, why go? I remember being like, I'm about to be a hero. <laughs> you know, I'm about to make the biggest play in Florida State history. Yeah. Because that uh, safety is not getting over here. And if Chris gets it to me, I'm about to boogie on this thing. So, um, man, it, that was a really good call. Like we, And like Chris said, I think we had it earlier in the game and we might have just missed it. But I had been open on it earlier. And I think I even caught one or two balls during the game on on just the fade outside because the, the, the technique that they were playing out wide was a real unique, you know, trap corner where the corner doesn't reroute you know it wasn't like that fourth and 14 coverage where he one checked you yeah. me and get his hands in and uh, mm-hmm. get me inside they weren't even trying to reroute the the wide out they were just letting him run free and so he let me run free and then the safety to my side he took off to to guard pk so there literally was nobody um on my side of the field yeah we got to find that all 22 that wide yeah out. yeah yeah and on the tv copy it pans by me and you see uh-huh. me standing there but the all 22, you see it and you're like, oh, man, that dude's open. <laughs> D-Rob, you are a hero, man. You got the fourth and 14. I mean, nobody's going to oh, yeah, forget that. Yeah. So that next play would have been possible if he didn't make that play. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, you were definitely a hero in that game. So so we can roll. So we, the reason we're talking about this is because there was another fourth and 14. Alzon, if you can roll the, uh, the 2021 version of fourth and 14, if you got that one ready for us. We're going to talk about that. I'm sure you guys were watching the game the other day, night. Yeah. And what they had, and Florida State's obviously struggled quite a bit against its rivals the last few years. And uh, this is a huge must win for Mike Norvell and for this team. Now, as you guys pointed out, the difference in offensive philosophies between 2003 and 2021, a little different. Yeah. So, yeah. I, again, I kind of want to get your guys' expertise looking at this. You got, a, you got obviously, fourth and 14, Miami's 25-yard line. Uh, minute five, what were you guys, a minute 21, 31, whatever? Yeah, I think uh, it was a minute. Very, very similar, similar except Florida State's deep inside Miami's territory. Obviously, you guys were backed up a little bit. You got a single back, uh, Jordan Travis here in the situation. So let's, uh, I guess, roll, roll a little clip so you guys can see kind of where we're going. Roll it a little forward here. Yeah, the first thing is stop there 11, if we can, yeah. You know, they're an 11 personnel, so they've got one back yeah. and one tight end. But you notice um, a similarity here? How many of the rushing and is there a spy? Same yeah. thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's insane. That that's so, really, really weird that, that that would play out that way. Future D coordinators that are watching this, blitz, bring pressure, force them to get rid of the ball quick. It may not be the answer for everyone, but that's what I would do. Not give them that time to sit back and let the routes develop. Force them to hit as hot. Trust your defense is going to swarm yeah, and make the tackle. You guys talked before. It's interesting about you said Manny Diaz kind of defensive philosophy is generally it's he went he kind of went against his tendency here to only rush three and kind of go in a passive thing here. And I, obviously, in hindsight, you can say you should have brought some. I mean, what, what were your kind of thoughts when you guys are seeing this play out? Will they let Jordan sit back there and wait for everything to develop? You well, know, let's I just would, bring one I of those guys. Stop. Look, there's someone on the 25, and then there's someone on the hash. They're both just just sitting there. I mean, at least bring one of them more pressure. Yeah, I think they had two spies. Travis, bring them. Yeah, I think they had two because I don't know if you guys remember back. Clemson started doing this Venables, and he had two spies on Jordan Travis. So I guess mm-hmm. that's what they were mm-hmm. trying to do here as well. But that's yeah. a, when you're that close to the goal line on that situation, man. It, it, I don't know if you need two guys. It's gonna be a long way to run with all those guys back there. Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you, I was shocked because I've I've actually studied Manny Diaz, uh, you know, uh, a good amount. And I know he's one of the higher level blitzers. He loves to bring five man pressures. He's a fire zone guy. Um, and so I there was no doubt in my mind that that's what he was going to bring here. Um, now, that still doesn't mean that we couldn't have picked it up. And, you know, it's not like he's bringing an unblockable blitz. But I was pretty shocked um, to see that. 
And then the other thing was they went with a trips concept mm-hmm. where number the number two receiver clears out, you know, the zone or the safety. I believe that's number 80 right there. That's the, at the bottom right above mm-hmm. the 105. Mm-hmm. And he sort of clears out the underneath coverage, which is probably the concept that we should have run. Um, you know, like that, that, that's a, that's a much better, you know, fourth and 14 concept. You have a lot more vertical options, obviously. Yeah. They had the tight end and the boundary going vertical. And then number 80 clears it out for seven to, uh, to come underneath, um, you know, which is a very common, you know, uh, you know, concept that, that everybody runs. And actually we ran it. That was the more common concept actually when, when I was at Florida state that we actually ran, I believe we called it Nebraska. Is that mm-hmm. right, Chris? Yeah, that's right. I You're think up. we called it Nebraska and it was just number two receiver clears out. And then the outside underneath receiver runs a dig or a curl, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, uh, and so that, that's a, that was a good concept. Great call um you know by coach right there and and that's the concept that we it would have made more sense for us to run that than what we ran um because there's just more options there more vertical options to get the 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 fourth down uh, to get 14 yards where like i said on our concept there really was one guy that was an option uh, there we mentioned this earlier which is another eerie thing about this you guys picked up 24 yards on your fourth and 14 conversion this play went for 24 yards wow. different different team but a rival game in the final minute and of course Florida State a few plays later punches it in to take get the get basically the game winning score now I'm curious cuz this has been a little bit of debate people have talked about this with Diaz so I'm curious you guys are both into coaching a lot Florida State gets down the 1 inch line there's still about a minute left Miami's got a couple timeouts left do you let if you're a coach, do you let Florida State score? Put yourself up. You're only down three at that point. You got a minute left, a couple timeouts left. If you let them score, and you got a pretty good young quarterback who's been pretty effective, or do you agree with Diaz and he just told his team, "Bow up. We're just gonna we're gonna try to stop him now." I mean, I'm curious. What, what's your take on that? You go first, D. Rob. I I would say I'm trying to stop him. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of you know, the new school, new age guys and, and, uh, you know, would, would lean to letting them score there. I'm not, I'm, I'm a new school guy, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I still come from Mickey Andrews tree. Yeah. We know, so, we know what Mickey would have done. And if you, and if, <laughs> no if, way if, if there's time on the clock and there's football being played, then you're trying to knock somebody's head off and that there's no, if, and there's no, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> there's no question about what to do in that situation. I still, that's still deep, too deep in my blood. And I don't know that I'll ever be able to, which actually the high school that I coach at, we got into a, um, have to let the the other team score mm. situation um, in in week one, and uh, man, it makes me really uncomfortable because I that my, the Mickey in me is uh, is too deep, it's too strong, and I I don't think you ever can let another team have success in in any way, shape, or form. Whether you're up a hundred or down a hundred, whether it's first down in ten or fourth down in fifty, you don't let them get a yard. Um, so that's I don't I, I think he did the right thing or I don't want to say there is no right or wrong. It's just a mm-hmm. matter of preference. And my preference is, man, if we're playing a game, I'm trying to win. I'm trying to compete. And not that you're not trying to win if you let them score. But I, I want to compete on every play like every play has a history and a life of itself. So on this play, I never wanted on my ledger that I didn't play as hard as I possibly could. I get that. But Chris, yeah. being a, I mean, from a quarterback's perspective, don't you want the ball in your hands with a minute left to try to win it? <laughs> yes, but that's also uh, when you when you had Miami that had been struggling the previous few drives. That's not a ton of time to drive the field and get yeah. into field goal range. And Dominic mentioned it. You take into account the personality of the coach. Uh, when I did all the Texas games in 2012 for University of Texas, Manny Diaz was a defensive coordinator, and um, you know he got ripped a lot for being over aggressive and blitzing a lot and and uh, having that kind of aggressive mentality. But that's one thing I liked about him. And listen, when you're on the road playing your rival and arguably fighting for your job, I mean, imagine if he'd let them score and then they don't even get to the 50-yard line. Yeah. You have everyone saying, why'd you let him score? They, their goal line short yardage defense had been pretty solid in this game. Remember, they had the one turnover that Silvera got, which turned into a score for them. In a rivalry game like this, I don't think you let anyone score. You trust your goal line defense. And hey, let's let's force this Florida State offense to score on us. 
maybe if there's two or three minutes left, but with about a minute left, again, that's not a ton of time. And um, uh, their quarterback wasn't looking as great in those last few drives as he was uh, in the third quarter when they got them the lead. So I think it was a right call to, tr- to make Florida State earn it. And um, again, there just wasn't a ton of time on the clock to to bring them back. Uh, but luckily, it worked out to Florida State's advantage. At first, when they didn't score on that, I'm like, shoot, now they got to they got to score from the goal line, but it worked to their advantage because they were able to use up all that game clock, which didn't allow uh, Miami to have a lot of time to put a, a field goal drive together. Gene, can but, I say this too? Uh, philosophically, you also have to think about the damage that you're doing true. by letting them score. If you're if you're Manny Diaz and you're early in your tenure and you've, you've instilled in these guys that, hey, man, we are going to hit people in the mouth and we're taking no prisoners and all these other things that coaches, you know, do in that moment, man, you're really sending a very, very strong message. If you go, Hey, now we're going to let them score. Yeah. True. Exactly. Like That's that, good. The damage there could be irreversible. And that could be something that you're answering to three years down the field. If you've got a freshman or a so- three years down the, down the road, you've got a freshman or a sophomore out there. He'll, that will, that will affect him. He'll remember the rivalry game in Tallahassee when coach said, Hey, let them score. Yeah. And you know, you have to be careful of, of those things, man. Those, those things can be very damaging and, and um, you know, giving them your very best shot and letting them score could actually be something that comes back to, um, you know, help you two or three years down the road. And uh, instead of hurting you when a guy goes, ah, maybe I'm just going to take this play off. I remember when coach gave us permission to do that. Yeah, and that, Manny, Manny's a he's a defensive coordinator with a lot of pride. Yeah. You don't want to be known as a soft D <laughs> coordinator, and when you're the head coach, that adds another layer to it. I think right. if they let him score, that yeah. defense and that program loses a lot of respect for him. Not that you want them to, to score uh, on that short yard, but if you just let him score, I think that's a whole other um, firestorm that Manny Diaz is dealing with. Well, Dominic, that was a good point. That's why you're coach for the Capital C. Uh, you <laughs> look right. at you look at several lev- levels to this. There's a lot of nuance besides just looking at the numbers. For Sometimes sure. when it goes yeah. to coaching, it goes to the mentality of your team and the emotions that go into a rivalry like this. Big Unless time. I want to ask and you the recruits guys, that are watching the game, yeah, all, all of that. Yeah, if you're a defensive yeah. recruit, you see that puts, probably puts a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah, I want to play man. for a team. I'm a D lineman and I want to yeah. I want to win the game. And yeah, I know coach is going to not give me the opportunity to do that. Man, I don't know if I want to go play for that guy. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So last I'm going to ask you guys. I know you watch Florida State. You keep up with it. have been some rough couple of years. That's why I brought you on. This is such – I mean, if you could have been in Doak for that, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It felt like the old school atmosphere. People are so into it. Again, they're so excited what's going on. If I can get real quick your impressions of where the where you see the program going and what you think of Mike Norvell and what he's been able to accomplish this season. Yeah, I, I like Coach Norvell. I've been uh, fortunate to have a few conversations with him. He did a, a Zoom when he first got the job with a lot of the former players, invited all the players to be on a Zoom call with him as he uh, really uh, spelled out the vision and the mission of the program and and where they were going. And, um, you know, I, I really like the direction he's taking it. And we're, I think we're trending in the right direction. And, and I think you look at the heart of the man, you look at the work ethic, to see all the time that he's putting in, he, he really cares and he gets it. And I'm not saying that Willie Taggart didn't. Um, I, I didn't know Willie. Um, I didn't have any conversations with him, unfortunately. But just hearing um, Coach Norvell's heart for the program, his drive, how much he cares, um, I, I, I like the direction we're going. I think it just needs more time, more, um, more of his guys in and uh, more buy-in. But uh, I think we saw, we saw a glimpse of it in North Carolina. We, we've seen glimpses of it. And uh, just to see that win, I was so happy for them to get that win at home uh, through all the ups and downs they've been through for those that senior class uh, to get that kind of emotional win against Miami in your home stadium. I know uh, if I could feel it all the way in California, I knew Dominic could feel it in Texas. Uh, we were very happy for the boys. And Dom, what, what do you think of these guys from a coaching perspective? I guess, what do you see in this? And I guess right now, are you putting in your resume to Mike Norvell? It seems like uh, you got the chops to maybe be on the sideline here someday. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this um, just as a sort of a positioning statement that all of these guys need much more time than they're getting. Um, it, it's been very frustrating for me since I got out of college football um, watching these guys get fired just time in and time out after getting three years, five years, whatever it is. Um, Again, if we were to look back at the greatest coach of all time, 
you know, our coach Bowden. Mm -hmm. And we, if we made past judgment on him after, let's just say his first 10 years, um, in today's day and age, he probably would have been fired. And I don't even know what his record was or any of that, but being in the ACC with how competitive things are and the money and all this other, these other things, um, all of the great coaches of sort of our generation, um, you know, before college football became such a huge business, we're getting much greater opportunity to give the team and the program a personality and, uh, you know, a philosophy and a direction and a way to play. Um, and so these guys are getting judged way too harshly, way too quickly. And it, it really frustrates me. I'm super passionate about it. Obviously, again, being mm -hmm. a coach and being as into coaching as I am, um, you know, I feel the horrible. And, and, and again, I'm more frustrated or as frustrated as anybody with Willie Taggart's tenure. Mm -hmm. I, I did not like watching my own family, you know, play the sport that I'm obsessed with. It was hard for me to watch, not because of Willie Taggart or any one thing specifically, but as a whole, it wasn't a very fun product to watch. So I'm not here to say whether a guy deserves or doesn't deserve to get fired, but I am here to say that coaches, college coaches as a whole, need to have a lot more time runway leash mm -hmm. with the things that they're trying to implement because they're doing more than just coaching on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's so much that goes into being a college coach that this is not understood and it's not taken into account. Um, my guy up at UW just got fired, Coach Lake, after 13, 13 <laughs> games. This is a phenomenal coach, a phenomenal man. Maybe he made a, made a mistake. Uh, maybe he didn't. But either way, he deserved a lot more you know, time um, uh, to, to, to put his stamp on the program before being let go. And I could go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, I hope that we all, this includes me, give coach Norvell the opportunity to, um, you know, the same opportunity that we gave coach Bowden when he took the job, you know, 50, 60 years ago or whenever <laughs> it was, you know? Um, so I, I will say that. And um, and then I the other thing I'll say, the second thing is I went to the Clemson uh, game, the Clemson, Florida State game, and I was incredibly pleasantly surprised with the spirit that they played with. I was incredibly um, uh, pleased with the passion, the energy from the sideline. I could see it. I could feel it from the coaches, from the players, the style of play was a type of style that made me proud as a family member. Mm -hmm. um, that was something that you don't necessarily get to see or feel on TV. And being at the game, it was the first time during Norvell's tenure that I personally went, okay, I feel good about this thing. Like I'm proud of what I'm seeing in terms of, again, the passion, um, the approach, it felt um, it felt on schedule to me. So yeah, I, I, I the, again I can't say enough about the spirit that they played with was something that I don't think has existed. Now again, I haven't been to a game, so maybe it did last year and maybe it did during Taggart's tenure. But I just know it didn't come across for me on TV, and it came across that Clemson game, Clemson Florida State game. It mm -hmm. came across like this is a team that's playing with the spirit that I can be proud of as a, as an alum and as a uh, you know family member. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> That's one thing that really strikes me about this team and what Norvell's been able to do. There's fighting these kids. I mean, if you watch some of the games, it doesn't matter if Florida State falls behind. They could have given up this game down eight. You know, everything was going against them. They yeah. had some weird plays that went against them in the second half, but you just knew this team has done this all year. They fought back. Guys, we go on and on talking about this. This is great. I definitely want to have you guys back to do more of these things. This is really cool. And I appreciate you taking some time out from your busy schedules to spread the love to Florida State Nation. It's a, it's a good time right now. Everybody's really excited after what happened. And, you know, a couple more games. They might be in a bowl game, guys. So uh, let's hope they get it done with two more games. Chris Ricks, Dominic Robinson, you guys the best. I miss you, guys. I hope you get out to Tallahassee soon. Well, hopefully they don't need a, a fourth and 14 to beat the Gators this year. Um, I'm expecting us to beat them by double digits. Oh, but, Chris. Uh, wow. But, uh, Gene, thank you so much for, for having us on. We love, we love War Chant. And uh, D-Rob, love you, brother. 
Love thank you, guys. Man. Thank hey, you, thank D-Rob. You. I appreciate you uh, thinking of us and having us on. And, um, yeah, let's do it again. And uh, hopefully we'll see you, be able to see you at a bowl game. It's yeah, that'd be nice. Hey, get out to Arizona, man. I, I've won, I've one of my favorite bowls at Fiesta Bowl. That's a lot of fun. Love it. See you guys out there. Thanks, guys. D-Rob, Chris Ricks, joining us on War Chant TV. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, Aslan. Seminole Nation.